In this video, what I want to do is show you how to find the domain of a function algebraically. Now we're going to focus on functions that have the restrictions with a square root as well as rational functions. And I'm going to do that by working through 10 different examples. Now, when you're finding the domain of a function algebraically, it's important to kind of know what to look for and what process to follow. So that's why for this video, what I'm going to do is work through a step-by-step -step process. That's going to help you find the domain for any function algebraically. Before we get started, let's go through these steps that are not exact, but are gonna guide you through the problems. First, always look to simplify the problem. A lot of times it's gonna be easier when we're working with identifying the restrictions when the problem is in simplified form. Number two, once you have it in simplified form, look for your restrictions. Now, there's a couple different restrictions, but in this video, we're gonna only focus on two. One, you cannot divide by zero. Two, you cannot take the square root of a negative number. Three, set up an equation to represent your restriction and then solve. In this video, that's gonna be focused on equation as well as an inequality. Four write the domain of the function based on your solution. Now, what we're gonna do in this video is I'm also gonna show you how to graph it and then write your domain in interval notation. But there are many other ways to write your domain. It all just kinda of depends on what you need. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, here we go, guys. Here are the steps that I just went over. Just again, to remember to give you as a guide to kinda of follow along. I use these steps whenever I'm working through the problem. So I thought I might provide them to you as a benefit when you're working for problems on your own. Now let's go and put these steps into practice. For this first example, I have f of x equals x plus four. Now this is a fairly basic problem, so don't worry, we are gonna get more advanced, but I want to explain and understand the domain here. Remember, the domain is a set of all values that we can plug into the function. I can't simplify this function any further. Also, there's no restrictions because I can plug in any number in for x and I'm always gonna get an output. So therefore, since I can plug in any number as my input and I'm gonna get an output, my domain is going to be all real numbers. Again, there's no restriction on my domain. And again, if you wanted to look at this graphically, you could see that this graph is going to extend to the left as well as extend to the right infinitely along the x-axis. Now we want to write the domain. There's a couple different ways we can do this. We can write all real numbers, or we can look at the graph of the x-axis to be able to write it as an inequality notation or interval notation. So if I was going to create a graph of the x-axis here, all I'd simply do is draw a nice horizontal line. And again, this horizontal line represents the x-axis of the physical graph, but it really just represents the domain, all the values that are defined for this function. And since we looked at this algebraically as well as graphically, we know that the domain is true for all real numbers. So we can just shade in this whole horizontal line. So first, just to kind of cover some things, we can write this as an inequality, which would look like this. Since the graph is extending to the left, it's going to go to negative infinity. And since it's extending to the right, it's going to go to positive infinity. So we'd say negative infinity is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to infinity. But in this video, I want to focus on using the intervals, which is basically going to be what is the farthest left as well as the farthest right that the graph is defined, excluding any restrictions. And since we don't have any restrictions, we can say it's from negative infinity to positive infinity. And again, I'm going to use parentheses to represent not included because negative infinity and infinity are not actually values of the function. Two. Now in this example, I have f of x equals the square root of x minus eight. Remember, we cannot take the square root of a negative number. So whatever is under the radical, which we call the radicand, has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? You cannot take the square root or any even root of a negative number. So what I can do is I can set whatever is under my radical to greater than or equal to zero. Now, all I simply need to do is go ahead and solve. Again, I'm going to graph this on a line graph to represent my domain so I can now write the domain. Now you can see a couple points here that eight can be defined for the function because when I plug eight into the function, I get zero and you can take the square root of zero. So it's important that eight is actually defined for this function. So eight is included within the domain. Now, no number un less than eight is in within the domain, but it's all values from eight going towards infinity or that are larger than eight are defined. So I'll say eight with a bracket because now it is defined going towards infinity, which means larger numbers. And I'll use again a parenthesis because infinity is not defined. Three, in this example, we have the basically the exact same problem that we had before. Just notice though, we have this nine minus X. That's gonna make a little bit of a change. So again, anything under the radical has to be greater than or equal to zero. Set the radicand greater than or equal to zero using an inequality. Then you can go ahead and solve. And remember when you're solving in this case, when you subtract the nine to both sides and you divide by negative one, you need to make sure you flip the sign. Now I'm gonna go and create my line graph and I'm just gonna use again, I'll just put nine in the middle and I'm going to choose all values or I'm going to shade to all values that are going to be less than or equal to nine. And now you can see from here, this graph is going to continue going to the left as far as the domain values, the values that are defined are going to be going to
to the left, which would be from negative infinity, all the way up to nine, which is going to be included. Four. In this example, what we have is f of x equals one over x plus three. Now again, remember, we cannot divide by zero. So what we need to do is think to ourselves, what number, if we were to plug in for x, would make our denominator equal to zero? Hopefully in this example, it's pretty obvious. It's negative three. If you make x equal to negative three, negative three plus three is equal to zero. But not every problem is going to be as easy as this. So what we're going to want to do is create a system here. We want to be able to find the values that makes our denominator equal to zero. So rather than using an inequality like we did in the last two examples, what we're going to do is create an equation. I want to find the values that make the denominator equal to zero. Those are the values we're going to exclude from the domain. Now, once I've gone and set up my equation, all I simply need to do is go ahead and solve. And then when I'm graphing this, I'm going to make sure that that solution is excluded from the domain. Now, the way that you're going to exclude it is going to be using a open circle. So in the previous examples, when I had a point that was defined, I filled in the circle. But if I have a point that is undefined, like in this case, x equals negative three, then I'm going to use an open circle. Now, if you look at this equation, there's no other values that the function is undefined for. So therefore, we can fill in the whole line graph as the domain, but just leave the point at negative three open. Now, when writing the domain here, we can basically think about this. The domain is all real numbers except for negative three. But how do we do this in interval notation? Well, to do that, what we're simply going to do is just find the domain of each of these sections separately. So we're going to find the domain to the left of negative three, and then the, to find the domain to the right of negative three. And then we'll just use a union symbol to combine them together. And again, it's important to note that negative three is not defined for this graph. That's why I'm using the parentheses, just like I did for negative infinity and positive infinity. Five. In this example, we have f of x equals one divided by x squared minus four. And again, we cannot divide by zero. So what values are going to make our graph equal to zero? And again, hopefully in this case, you might know the answer. But again, let's practice writing our equation and then solving. So all I'm going to do is set x squared minus four is equal to zero. Then I'm going to add the four to both sides. And then I'm going to take the square root and make sure when you introduce the square root, you have plus or minus two. Now we're going to have the values that make our function undefined is actually going to be two values, negative two as well as positive two. But again, those are our only restrictions. So my domain here is all real numbers except negative two and two. So my graph is going to look exactly the same as the other one. All I'm simply going to do is draw the x axis and then have an open circle at negative two and an open circle at positive two, where the rest of the domain of my line graph can go ahead and be filled in. Now to find the domain here in interval notation, again, now you can see I had three sections, right? I have the section to the left of negative two. I have the section in between negative two and two, and I have the section to the right of two. So we're just going to find the domain for each section separately, and then again, combine them using the union symbol. So most left section, they'll say from negative infinity to negative two using a parenthesis. Then I'll use parentheses negative two to positive two, then parentheses positive two to infinity and combining them all with some union symbols. Six. Now in this example, things are going to start combining rather than just focusing on one restriction at a time. You can see now we have multiple restrictions. I not only have the square root where I know I cannot take the square root of anything less than zero, but I also have a variable in the denominator. And remember, we cannot divide by zero. So the main thing I, I recognize in this case first is I recognize what's in my denominator. And remember, when we have something in the denominator, it cannot equal to zero. So which restrictions should we do first? Should we use both of them? Can we do both of them? And the answer is yes. Now, in this case, there's a little bonus trick that you can use to be able to solve these much faster because so for a lot of problems, we're going to have to solve each restriction separately. In this case, we can actually solve them together. And the reason being is I know based on my radical that x minus four has to be greater than or equal to zero. So if I set that as an inequality, as x minus four greater than or equal to zero, and I add four to both sides, I'm going to get the domain restriction of x has to be greater than or equal to four because anything less than four would make my radical negative. But again, we have to be careful because four cannot work because if you plugged in four in for x, that'd be four minus four, which is zero. That's fine for the radical restriction, but again, that makes now my denominator equal to zero. So what I can do here now is just change my answer from x has to be less than or equal to four to x has to be less than four. So what I'm gonna do in this case is I'm gonna focus on the radical re domain restriction first. And I know that the square root of x minus four, I know x minus four has to be greater than or equal to zero. So I'm gonna go ahead and set that up first. 
Typically, when we're dealing with radicals, we use the greater than or equal to because you can take the square root of zero. However, in this case, notice that the radical is in the denominator. Whenever you have the radical in the denominator, you cannot have zero, right? So therefore, I'm just going to change my inequality to x minus four is greater than zero. Now I can go ahead and solve and then create my graph. So now you can see that I used a open circle at four because the value is not included, right? Look back at the equation. If you were to plug four in for x, that's gonna make the denominator equal to zero. When I'm writing my domain in interval notation, make sure you're using a parenthesis at four instead of a bracket, seven. Now in this example, I do have two restrictions. I have a radical in the numerator and I have a variable expression in the denominator. So I am gonna have to set up both of my domain restrictions separately. And then what you're gonna want to do is solve them separately and then combine the graphs of the domain on the same x-axis to write the domain. Let's take a look at how this is going to work. It doesn't matter which one you pick. I'll go ahead and pick the top and I'll say, all right, x plus three has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? So I'll go ahead and solve that, subtract the three on both sides, and I get x has to be greater than or equal to negative three. Then I'll set the denominator equal to zero. Remember, this represents though the values that the graph cannot equal. So x minus three equals zero, add a three to both sides, x equals three. This is what the graph is not defined for. Now what I'm gonna do is graph them separately and then combine them to the same graph. Eventually, you're gonna get better at this and you can just graph them together on the same graph without having to do them separately. But let's go and first graph x is greater than or equal to negative three, all values greater than negative three with negative three being included. And then for X cannot equal negative three, that is domain is all real numbers. The only restriction is X cannot equal negative three, which would be an open circle. Now, if I'm going to combine these two graphs, basically what you're trying to do is put both graphs on top of each other and your domain of your function is only going to be the parts where both restrictions are going to be true. And what you can see is both restrictions are only true from negative three to three and then three to infinity, where negative three is going to be included, so that's gonna be using a bracket, and then three is not gonna be included, so we'll be using a parentheses. So therefore, we'll write the domain separately for each section. So the first section will be negative three, to three, and then the next section will be from negative three to infinity, using the appropriate brackets and parentheses. Eight, two inequalities of two minus x is greater than or equal to zero, and x plus two is greater than zero. Then I'm gonna go ahead and solve them separately, and then graph them on the same x-axis, so therefore I can go ahead and write the domain of their combined domains. And by graphing it this way, you can see that the only place where the two domains are going to be defined is between negative two and positive two, where positive two is going to be included. So my domain will now be negative two with a parenthesis, comma to positive two with a bracket. Nine. Now in this example, I have the square root of x squared minus one. And just like we've done before, we're gonna set our radicand greater than or equal to zero. Now here is where some problems though are going to start. And again, it, they only get worse the more complicated our solutions get. So remember, x squared minus one has to be greater than or equal to zero. You don't wanna solve this algebraically. In my opinion, the easiest way to understand what values make this inequality true is to look at this from a graphical approach. So to do that, what I can do is I can factor x squared minus one into x minus one times x plus one. Now, if you were to think about this as a linear equation and y equals x minus one times x plus one, those would represent my x-intercepts and I would have a parabola that is actually opening up. So it's important to see from this graph what x values that when we plug into the function is gonna give us a value that is positive. Well, obviously any value between negative one and positive one is gonna give us a value that is going to be negative. Our values that when we plug them into the function is gonna give us positive values is gonna be anything less than negative one and anything greater than positive one. And you can see this visually by looking at the graph. Now I could represent this on a number line simply by just having two included points at negative one and positive one and then shading all values to the left and all values to the right, leaving the values between negative one and one open. So therefore my domain is negative infinity to negative one with the bracket because it's included union from positive one to infinity using the bracket at one. 10. All right, ladies and gentlemen, in this example, I have f of x equals x minus four divided by x squared minus 16. This is actually an example we can go ahead and simplify, but it's important to understand sometimes simplifying is gonna help you out and sometimes it can actually harm you. I prefer to always look at things in simplified form. So in this example, I am going to factor my denominator into a x minus four times x plus four. So I get a better visual picture of what is going on in this function. Now you can see that the the x minus fours would divide out. But again, it's very important that even though they would divide out, they're just a removable discontinuity. When you're finding the domain, bonus tip, pay attention. When you are finding the domain, we're not just classifying holes versus asymptotes. Those are both discontinuities. Those are both not defined in the domain. So we, even though x minus four 
that factor gets divided out, we still need to make sure it is not included within the domain. And this is where I was telling you about, it can be tricky with simplifying. You always want to simplify to make sure you're working with easy numbers, but don't let simplifying make you get the wrong answer. So in this case, I'm going to take my denominator and I'm going to set it equal to zero. And then this one is really easy because I have the zero proc property. So I can set X minus four equals zero, as well as X plus four equals zero to go ahead and solve getting X equals four and X equals negative four. Now, when I go ahead and graph this again, remember these just represent the values that is not defined for the function. So the function is defined for all real numbers except for negative four and four. So to represent that on the domain on a number line, I'm just going to use two open circles at negative four and four with all the other values included. So my domain in this case is going to be from negative infinity to negative four union negative four to four union four to infinity. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, 10 different examples on how to find the domain of a function. I hope this is helpful for you. If you want to see more examples of even some easier or more difficult problems, then go ahead and check the playlist down below. And if you're interested in some common tips and tricks or common mistakes, then go ahead and check the next video. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.